The Gospel of Thomas is one of the most enigmatic and popular uh, of the ancient scriptures found in Nag Hammadi. So uh, we're going to dig into it as in a kind of a broad sense, not in our individual Logia sense like we have done in the past. Uh, so stay around, stick around and uh, we'll talk about that. Hi everybody, I'm Father Tony, and apparently this is my first day doing introductions on this show. Um, but anyway, <laughs> joining me is Jonathan Stewart. Hello, Jonathan. Hello, Father Tony. Hi, uh, how is uh, Montreal? Is it great? It's, it's a lot better since last time I spoke to you. Yeah. Uh, the, the weather is up and down, but uh, for amazing segues, funny you should mention the uh, the fine city in the Belle Provence. Oh, yeah? Because, yes, because our guests are nice. It's our second guest, best uh, based out of Montreal. So it's very exciting. Yeah, you are uh, bringing in all of your all of your neighbors. <laughs> yeah. And let's introduce our guest. We have Dr. Andre Gagné of the of Concordia University from the fine city of Montreal. Hello, Andre. Welcome to the show. Hello. Hello, pleasure to be here. And uh, you are a uh, professor of New Testament and uh, Gnosticism at Concordia. So uh, we thought we would have you on to talk a little bit about the Gospel of Thomas, which is a subject that you have uh, researched. So thanks for, thanks for your expertise on this subject. Good. Let's jump right in. So All right. What, uh, what do you think the Gospel of Thomas is? Yeah, that's that's a verse, a very good uh, first question. <laughs> Essentially, uh, if if we 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 try to give a, a a broad answer to this question, it's essentially a collection of 114 sayings uh, that are, according to this gospel, attributed to uh, Jesus. Uh, of course. 114 sayings, uh, we say 114 sayings, but this is the uh, scholarly designation. Mm -hmm. uh, there's not, nothing in the original Coptic Gospel of Thomas that actually indicates 114 sayings. Uh, the text is written, essentially the complete text of the Gospel of Thomas is written in uh, Coptic. Uh, some scholars have argued that uh, there were uh, there was a discovery at the beginning of the 20th century of fragments of what they now consider being the Gospel of Thomas uh, in Greek, which would correspond to about 20 of the 114 logia. Mm -hmm. And so it, we 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 like it here. Oh, you know, we've we've done yeah. a whole series of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I saw. Uh, yeah, I saw that. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> But I think, strictly speaking, we don't consider it to be Gnostic in the sense that some of the other texts from Nag Hammadi are, are very obviously Gnostic. Okay. Um, what, what is your thoughts on that? Do you think it was originally written for a Gnostic audience, or do you think that it was just a very early Christian document that yeah. was co-opted? This is another great question, and it's been a debate since the discovery of uh, the Gospel of Thomas itself. Uh, there's been a lot of debate among scholars with respect to uh, is it Gnostic, is it not Gnostic, because it's found, of course, it's part of a collection that is called the Nagamati collection, mm -hmm. where a lot of these texts are often labeled as Gnostic. The thing is, uh, in scholarly debate today, all the question of what constitutes Gnosticism mm -hmm. and what, uh, what we call Gnostic is, is questioned. Yeah. Uh, in a basic sense, um, in, in a very, very basic sense, the Gospel of Thomas can still be understood as being Gnostic. And I will explain why I think that way. Okay. It's because if we, if we think in terms of Gnostic and, and we, we root it in the understanding of the word gnosis, which means knowledge, the Gospel of Thomas focuses, its main emphasis is on knowledge. It's on uh, essentially the secret sayings of Jesus. And of course, the, the introduction says, Who, whosoever finds the interpretation of these secret sayings uh, will not experience death. So there is a, 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 a need for the reader of the Gospel of Thomas to engage in a quest to understand these secret sayings. 
So in a sense, these secret sayings are, are, are the content of these sayings is, is, is gnosis. It's, it's some kind of hidden knowledge. It, of course, it's not the classical way of understanding maybe what constitutes a Gnostic text if we compare it to other texts like, for example, the Apocryphon of John, which has a, a very, very elaborate um, uh, demiurgical myth. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, if we take the notion or the idea of gnosis as knowledge, the Gospel of Thomas is a text that incites readers to acquire a certain kind of knowledge in order to experience salvation. Yeah, okay, that's a, that's a pretty good answer. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, it's definitely something, I mean, obviously we think that it's, it's useful to people who follow a Gnostic path. Yes, uh, yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. yeah. The, the lack of the demiurge, you know, it doesn't bother me too, too much because, you know, not every Gnostic text is going to address cosmology. You know absolutely, I mean? you're absolutely right, yeah. absolutely right. But again, you see this, this idea that even the Gospel of Thomas does not talk about a demiurge, um, as you say, it doesn't mean that uh, because there's no elaborate myth that we're not dealing with some kind of Gnostic uh, text. At the same time, there could be in the Gospel of Thomas, and I have argued this in some of my publications, there could be some kind of veiled references to uh, what we would consider being a demiurgical uh, figure for example, if you think about uh, Logion 100, Logion 100 uh, is a, a saying that's very, very similar to a lot of uh, people that are familiar with the New Testament. Uh, it talks about giving unto Caesar what belongs to Caesar and unto God what belongs to God. But there's a little twist. If, I, if you uh, give me the permission to just read that saying, it sure. says they showed Please. Jesus a gold coin and said to him, uh, Caesar's people demand taxes from us. He said to them, give Caesar the things that are Caesar's, give God the things that are God's, and give me what is mine. So what's, what's interesting here is the fact that there seems to be some kind of gradation between the notion of we're talking about Caesar in one sense then we're talking about God in another sense and lastly we're referring to Jesus mm -hmm. so you have Caesar who's the temporal ruler you have God who seems to be a spiritual being and then you have Jesus that seems to be even above God so um, I started arguing that the God that is referred to in that Logion is not necessarily the Father, which Jesus mentions elsewhere in the Gospel of Thomas, and he talks about his Father, or the Father, or your Father. Mm -hmm. It is the only place in the Gospel of Thomas where you have the word nute which is a reference to God. There's only one other reference uh, in Logion. Uh, I think it's 33, but it talks about the, uh, where there are many gods. But here it's the only reference where we talk about God and we don't talk about the Father. Mm. So when Jesus talks about uh, his Father, there's always going to be something very positive in relation to his father, your father, the father. But here in the context of this saying, um, it seems as if Jesus is even above this God. You see, he says in the end, which, which he says, give what, is, what belongs to me, give, give it to me. What is mine, give it to me, to me. So he puts himself over that God. And that could be an indication that there's a connection between the, the temporal ruler of Caesar and that God. And Caesar is kind of that representative of that demiurge on, on earth, essentially. And Jesus is above and beyond that God. So there could be, just in that saying, a kind of a veiled 
reference to some kind of demiurgical figure um, without necessarily having an elaborate cosmological demiurgical myth attached to it. So you, you see, I, I think we need to uh, we need to to look at these things, and this is why reading the Gospel of Thomas holistically, not just saying by saying, uh, but really holistically as a, as a, as a, some kind of coherent document, we're able to make those distinctions. Ah, that's that's actually an excellent segue into my next question, and we will come back to the the demiurge and the archons <laughs> hiding in the yeah. Gospel of Thomas in our next yeah. section. But uh, is there is there a, a structure to Thomas, or is it just kind of a collection of random sayings? It's a good question. It has been uh, since its discovery. It's actually been argued um, most of the time that the Gospel of Thomas is just a collection of random sayings uh, that have no relationship to, uh, to one another. I personally have a very difficult time with, with this proposal uh, because I try to take seriously what is called the incipit and the first uh, saying of that Gospel, where in the incipit we, it's clearly mentioned that Jesus spoke these words and that uh, uh, Judas Didymus Thomas wrote those words down. And then the, the second saying, which I, I, I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, whosoever finds the interpretation of these sayings will not experience death. So if there is an interpretation to be found, this means that there has to be some kind of coherent way of reading or figuring what the meaning of that text actually is. If it's only a random collection of sayings that have no relationship whatsoever between them, then why would the opening uh, statement actually encourage readers to engage in a quest to find the interpretation? So the text itself programs the reader in a particular way by inciting him to engage in reading the text in order to discover its meaning. So I think that Thomas is, is, um, is purposefully uh, kind of complicated, but it's part of the quest, you see? Um, part of the pedagogical element in Thomas is to kind of shuffle the deck of cards in a sense. You see those logia as you know, cards that are shuffled around. And the reader has the responsibility to put certain logia together and construct what I call a, a network of meaning between various uh, logia in order to have the meaning emerge while they're reading. But to be able to do that, you need to be very, very familiar with the text. You can't you can't come to this kind of realization with reading Thomas, uh, you know, as a first reading. You have to read and reread and and re, you know, revisit the text constantly to be able to make those associations between sayings. And often this association is already uh, uh, formally built in between the sayings because Thomas contains a series of what we would call catchwords between each of these sayings. So a lot of these sayings are linked with catchwords. For example, you're going to have a saying where you're going to find the word kingdom. The following saying will also contain the word kingdom, but will have another word, let's say children, which will follow up in the following saying. And it's like a cascade of sayings linked with various types of key of, of keywords or, or yeah. So this is essentially how you build meaning. So I don't think it's a, it's a random collection of, of sayings. I think that there is a pedagogy in which readers have to engage themselves and familiarize themselves with the text in order to find the secret sayings or the meaning of the secret words of Jesus. Yeah, that's very interesting. And uh, I think we're going to get into a lot more detail in that in the podcast. I also wanted to ask you some questions uh, later on about the Q document and, uh, yeah. you know, some of the relationship between the Gospel of Thomas and some other Gnostic texts. So we'll get into all of that in the podcast. Uh, in the meantime, um, where, where would you like to send people if they wanted to look you up online? 
Oh, essentially, it's not too not too complicated. I have a personal website, uh, Andre uh, Gagné, one word, dot Weebly uh, dot com. Uh, they can visit uh, my website there. There's a lot of different. Uh, you know, information on about who I am, what I've done, uh, where where I teach, what I teach. Uh, there's my CV. There's uh, uh, there's also opeds and interviews that I've, I've done. And we also have uh, a, a section on that website dedicated to what is called the Nagamati Seminar. It is a seminar, a uh, scholarly seminar that I've been leading at Concordia University for uh, the past uh, seven years now. And uh, you have information there on 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 that seminar. Mm. Um, and uh, yeah, you can visit that. We also have a podcast. There's information on the website uh, concerning that. All right, fantastic. Well, thanks for joining us, and we look forward to continuing our conversation in the podcast. Thank you. All right, and for all of you who are watching along at home, we will see you next week. This has been a production of the Gnostic Wisdom Network. For more information about this and all of GWN's programming, please visit GnosticWisdom.net. The opinions expressed in this show do not necessarily reflect the opinions of GWN, the Apostolic Joannite Church, or any other organization. This has been released under a Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike 4.0 International License, and is brought to you by the generous support of our patrons. To support our programs and become a patron, please visit Patreon.com slash Gnostic. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash G-N-O-S-T-I-C.